During the difficult days of World War II, there was one group of warriors that was so instrumental to the Allied war effort that leaders of the United States hailed them as being indispensable to the war effort. These men also bore the price of war more than any other branch of the military, suffering the highest death rate per capita. Yet these men have been largely ignored in history, and by the very country they swore to serve. These are the men of the US Merchant Marine. Welcome to Facts Fanatics. Today we're going to look at the true stories of the brave men of the US Merchant Marines during World War II. These men faced countless dangers, not only in the middle of a battlefield with a rifle in hand, but mostly on unarmed and unprotected ships on oceans near and far. But what is a merchant marine? Well, they were sailors with a very specific job to carry cargo. They were not considered to be part of the armed forces, but instead were private civilians who manned civilian ships contracted by the government to carry vital cargo across the world during the war. They continue in that role even today. In fact, the vast majority of supplies that supported the Allied war effort were transported on these mostly unarmed civilian merchant ships, manned by ordinary men from every town in America. As a result, they also carried a massive target on their backs. Hitler ordered his U-boats to sink as many of these cargo ships as possible. Every time a vessel set sail, the men had to resign themselves to the fact that this voyage may be their last. Despite these dangers, these brave men were often treated as second-class citizens in their own hometowns. It was a risky line of work, one that was both in the spotlight and completely unappreciated. The men on board didn't fight on the front lines, and so they received no respect from their fellow soldiers. And yet, they were so instrumental to the Allied forces' success that they were a prime target for Hitler's forces. In fact, some of the first American deaths of World War II were not soldiers, but instead, merchant seamen. In late December of 1940, a year before America entered the war after Pearl Harbor, the Panamanian flag tanker SS Charles Pratt, carrying an American crew of 42 men, was about 220 miles from her destination at Freetown, Sierra Leone. The Charles Pratt was owned by an American company and had traveled from Aruba with a cargo of nearly 100,000 barrels of oil. Suddenly, without warning, she was torpedoed by a German U-boat, U-68, in the afternoon of December 21, 1940. The Charles Pratt was unarmed. The entire crew was forced to abandon the ship. The two American merchant marines lost their lives in this uninitiated and unexpected attack. These men were not only the ones who lost their lives before the war even started for America, by the time the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, which served as a trigger point for American forces getting involved in the war, six merchant mariners had already been killed by the Japanese. In response to these types of attacks, the US began to mass produce cargo ships that would be used to carry war material in large quantities. These were the Liberty ships the first of the Liberty Fleet, and they would be both the home and the grave for many Marines over the course of the Second World War. These ships carried much cargo, but they were slow, traveling at a maximum speed of 10 knots per hour, and were generally unarmed. They became easy prey for the eager U-boat captains seeking victory at sea. As cargo ship losses mounted, the United States tried to respond by arming some of its cargo ships. These ships were still slow moving, and they were manned almost entirely by civilians. And yet despite these mounting dangers, these brave seamen knew their duties, and they kept sailing. William Chambers was one of those men. Chambers served as an officer on several boats during the war, and graduated from the Pennsylvania Nautical School in October of 1941. He obtained his seaman papers, or Z certificate as it was often called, in June 1939. Many of the sailors with the Z certificate were often called Z-men. Chambers learned that the war had begun for the United States while on board his first posting on the SS Steelmaker making its way to Honolulu, Hawaii. While he was eating breakfast before going on his shift, the captain came into the officer's mess and announced that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor and that America was now at war. Had his ship been faster, it might have been one of the victims of Pearl Harbor's attack on December 7th. He made countless voyages, but none were safe. Even a simple cruise from Cuba to New York carrying sugar was fraught with danger, and the U-boats would often lay in silence, waiting to spring a deadly trap. His career followed the path of the Allied victories. When America landed its first troops in North Africa, he was there unloading weapons and ammunitions off the SS Robin Sherwood. He supported the Allied landings in Italy by offering an officer on the SS Charles Folger, and he had been ordered to go to Scotland to carry cargo supporting the Normandy landings on D-Day, June 6, 1944. But none of those journeys were as dangerous as the journey to Murmansk, Russia, while carrying 250 tons of explosives. His ship was only armed with machine guns used by the merchant seamen. There was no US Navy armed guard on board, and only two US Navy signalmen for communication purposes. 
They were under continuous air attack, which left eight ships in the convoy sunk by air attack. Three ships limped to their destination, barely under their own steam, after being viciously attacked. When they finally arrived at their destination at Murmansk, they unloaded the 250 tons of explosives straight away. After all, who wanted to be sitting on top of enough explosives to blow up a small town any longer than they had to? While trying to discharge the remaining cargo for Russia at another berth, they saw and heard a heavy explosion right at the location of where their explosives had been stored. Chambers thanked God that the explosion hadn't happened while the explosives were on board because no one would be able to survive that kind of damage. Despite their luck, the ship sustained too much damage and sank on June 3, 1942, while navigating through the Koala Inlet. Chambers and the rest of the surviving crew abandoned the ship and were picked up by a Russian patrol craft. Chambers was happy because he was alive. To this day, Chambers still doesn't know what hit him. The British said it was a mine, and the Russians claimed it was a submarine. Either way, he still continued to low cargo on the next ship. James Jolly James Alvin Jolly was a farmer's son from Turlock, California. He loved operating radio. The love of the radio attracted him to the Merchant Marines. He had completed one year at the Junior College at the College of Pacific in Stockton, California, where he was selected for the United States Maritime Service Program on Gallops Island in Boston Harbor where he started his two-year training in September of 1940. His first assignment was a radio officer aboard the tugboat Edmund J. Moran. That assignment had been delayed due to Jolly getting scarlet fever. And by the time he recovered, one of Jolly's classmates, Andy McLeod, had already lost his life while being assigned to the convoy to Murmansk, Russia. So, with that trepidation and fear, Mr. Jolly joined the tugboat in its tasks. Initially, the Moran was assigned duty to pull ships that had been attacked and hit but not sunk. They were tasked to tow it and beach it so that they could save the cargo. One time they had been assigned the duty of retrieving torpedoed British ship named Anata, which contained iron ore. Jolly and his crew attached a line to the Anata and started to tow it. At that time, the United States did not have any blackouts, and the lights of Miami would illuminate the waters of the coast. Jolly and his crew would see the silhouettes of the German U-boats lining up to take a second shot at the Anata. This time, the German U-boats hit their mark again, and then the Anata started to sink. Jolly and his crew had to act quickly to cut the lines, otherwise they too would suffer the same fate as the Anata. Then they returned to try and rescue as many crew as possible, despite the fact that they were unarmed and German submarines prowled close by, waiting to pounce again. Many people asked Jolly why the submarines hadn't attacked him and his crew that night, and he explained that the only thing that saved the little tugboat was its propeller. At the time, the U-boats relied on sonar to determine the size and type of ship in the water, the German sonar operators would hear the propeller revolutions and determine the type of ship. Cargo ships usually turned at about 70 revolutions per minute, whereas Navy warships had a much higher propeller speeds of about 170 RPMs. Luckily for the little tugboat Moran and its crew, it had a diesel-electric twin-screw engine that had the same revolutions as the warships. So, as far as the Germans could tell, this little tugboat was a strong destroyer coming to the rescue. James Jolly saw more action up close and personal later in the war, when he and his tugboat were sent to part of the invasion of Kiska in the Aleutian Islands near Alaska. During that invasion, his tugboat was assigned the duty of moving barges next to the big ships where they would unload weapons and artillery and move it to the shore while they were under fire from the Japanese. Jolly barely survived that encounter and earned the Merchant Marine Combat Bar when a Japanese plane dropped a bomb onto his ship while machine guns from shore were shooting at him. Luckily for Jolly and his crew, the bomb damaged the Moran, but didn't destroy it. This was the first time Jolly had been shot at, but it wasn't the last. The next year, Jolly joined SS Samuel W. Williston. They started a 42-day, mostly unescorted journey from San Francisco to heading to the South Pacific. They were loaded to the gills with 50-gallon drums of gasoline. One night at 2 a.m. in the morning, all the crew felt a bump in the ship. Everyone looked for the cause and thought that the ship had just run over something in the water. The Williston then continued its voyage. When they got to port, they inspected the ship as part of normal procedure and found that they had been hit by a torpedo. This could have been a death sentence, as the ship was a floating gas refinery. By a stroke of good luck, the torpedo was a dud and it did not explode. James Alvin Jolly was a lucky man, but not every merchant mariner was that lucky. The SS Cynthia Olsen was hit by a torpedo launched by a Japanese submarine. The ship had been transporting lumber, heading to Honolulu. Every single mariner on the ship was lost that day. Not a soul returned home. The SS Cynthia Olsen was lost. On that very same day, 176 other merchant mariners were taken hostage by the Japanese. Many would not return. And yet, they did not withdraw. More and more mariners signed up to run these Liberty ships. Civilians, each and every one of them. 
Some were experienced mariners who had spent their entire lives on the deck of a ship, and others were young men who were only fresh out of high school. This is the case of Donald F. Pryor, who was only 16 when he joined the Merchant Mariners as a wiper, tasked with crawling inside of the boilers and between the deck's plates, where he would scrub them clean. He served straight to the end of the war, sailing through minefields, dodging submarines, and often being accosted by torpedoes as they carried their cargo, valuable supplies, from the frozen shores of Russia all the way to the Persian Gulf. Unfortunately, the US government did not consider this time served in the Merchant Marines as service in the military, and he was called back to duty in the army until 1951. During World War II, 243,000 men enlisted to be Merchant Marines. Of that number, 9,521 passed away. That means 4% of the men who joined the Merchant Marines perished, never again to return home. While 4% might not seem like a high amount, that percentage was a higher percentage of deaths than any other branch of the military. 733 Merchant Marine ships met a watery grave during the Second World War, brought down by torpedoes and minefields hidden beneath the darkened surface of the water. But perhaps a worse fate than those who were brought down by their ships was the fate of the 209 seamen that were captured by the Japanese. Many of these men were not given the rights that they were afforded to all combatants during the war. Now we have to ask what has kept their brave actions hidden away from the public eye. At the time, the work of merchant marines was considered to be logistical in nature and often disregarded as being something that occurred purely behind the scenes. Many people in the military and back home thought that these men were deserters and too scared to do their part. That attitude was pervasive, even in the government itself, which ordered these men into harm's way. That's why we don't often hear about merchant marines, and it's why few people have ever heard about Liberty ships. Although the president commended their bravery and selflessness, and General Dwight Eisenhower commended their valor, to this day, these men have been largely forgotten about by their country, which owes them an eternal debt of honor. Congress was reportedly called on to recognize the efforts of the merchant marines, and yet, nothing ever came of it. The active branches of the military mocked and condemned them, claiming them to be little more than civilians, and the government agreed with that assessment on all official levels. In fact, they were not even considered to be war veterans due to their civilian status until 1988, over 43 years after the war. This means that they could not access the government-mandated help that most veterans were able to rely on. They were pushed out of the limelight, left out of the history books, and then denied both recognition and assistance for many, many years. The war could not have been won without these brave men, and yet, many of their names have simply been lost to time internal. We hope that our video helps shed some light onto a much needed and seldom respected area of the war effort and history and that by learning their story here, you might share it elsewhere. If you like learning about the Merchant Marines, make sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to leave a comment before you go. We want to know, what is your favorite seldom shared war story?